Norman Clegg was there from start to end and provided a steadying hand on the rudder of the madcap antics of his contemporaries. Interviewed in 2003, Peter Sullis said, It happens sometimes in an actor's life, if you're very, very lucky, that something special turns up. When I read Last of the Summer Wine, I thought, this is it. Little did he know what a huge part the show would play in his life and the lives of so many other people. After the outbreak of the Second World War, Salish joined the Royal Air Force and became a wireless engineer. His on-screen persona, Clegg, served in the army but did not relish it. In real life, he took to amateur acting while in the RAF and after the war won a scholarship to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. He appeared in many British films and television series of the 1960s and 70s. Then, in 1972, he was cast in the BBC comedy playhouse one-off play The Last of the Summer Wine. Peter had already been in shows written by Roy Clark, who knew he wanted Sullis on the show. So Clark created the character of Norman Clegg, especially for Sullis, who liked the character and agreed to play him. Of course, no one knew the role would go on for 31 series over 37 years. In 2005, Peter Sallis voiced Wallace in Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Weir Rabbit, having himself appeared in the 1961 Hammer film, The Curse of the Werewolf. In Sallis's autobiography, entitled Fading into the Limelight, he said that his work as Wallace raised his standing a few notches in the public eye. Next to Summer Wine, the Wallace and Gromit animated films are probably Salis's best known performances. Peter Salis was appointed an OBE in the 2007 Birthday Honours for services to drama. We learn about some of Norman Clegg's early life from the spin-off prequel First of the Summer Wine, broadcast in 1988 and 1999, where Salis played David Clegg, the father of Norman, and Maggie Ellenshaw was Norman's mother, Violet. Norman Clegg is an only child, who thought his father didn't like him as David Clegg was quiet and rarely interacted with him. His mother was overprotective of her son and panicked when he was walked home by a girl a year older than him. The girl is probably Ruby Milburn, as Clegg admits in series 17 episode Desperate for a Duffield, she had a crush on him. He is so anxious and shy that he wears several layers of clothing, vest, shirt, jumper, waistcoat, jacket and finally a plastic mac, which he carries when it's not windy or raining. Norman Clegg married his wife Edith in 1940 and in the pilot episode we see him attending her memorial in the graveyard. The inscription on the headstone is Edith Clegg 1909 to 1971. So the headstone shows Clegg's late wife would have been 62 when she passed away. According to the prequel, First of the Summer Wine, Norman Clegg was born in 1921, so there was a 12 year age gap between Norman and Edith. Although it was very common for women to marry younger men, this would help explain his awkward feelings towards their relationship. Norman kept a photo he took of his wife in her bridal gown. He reminisces about his wife, her sharp tongue, and how she hated his camping phase. He clearly misses her, but simply out of loss rather than love. He admits to finding marriage confusing and that it was like a license to live in the same house. In series one and two, Peter Sullis uses a noticeably broad Yorkshire accent and adopts linguistic characteristics like abbreviating the word the to the. Quite what precipitated the change to less idiomatic language isn't certain. In general, the language used in the early series was much more traditionally northern, which suited the frequently grim looking locations. Clegg has no surviving relatives, and while he aims for a relaxing retirement from his job as a co-op linoleum salesman, he frequently gets involved with the others. He's a cynic and often critical of the ideas suggested by the third man of the era, but probably appreciates having something to occupy his time. In the Series 1 episode, The New Mobile Trio, Clegg suggests buying a cheap car to get out, do more. He admits to not being a good driver and demonstrates this when he crashes the car. 
As is the only one of the trio with a license to drive a car, Clegg finds himself pressed into driving whenever they have the use of a vehicle. Subsequent suggestions that he drives a car invariably result in a panic attack. In series 21, he proudly announces he doesn't hold a driving license anymore. Roy Clark injected intellectual material into the show in the form of Clegg's philosophical asides. This was more noticeable in the earlier episodes, especially while idling the time away in the library. The scripts relied more on the dialogue rather than the comedic situations that became more prevalent in later episodes. Although quieter and more laid back, Clegg is still seen to be enjoy the odd practical joke and even convinces Howard he's an orphan in the series 26 episode Little Orphan Howard. Clegg is the one who had the most average lifestyle. He says he realised he was middle-aged when he was 23. Even Nora, while in conversation with Ivy, describes him as dull and boring. In the series 26 episode, Hermione is a short course, Clegg has been going through his old diaries and typing them out. He says, it's fascinating really, remembering what you were doing. When asked what he was doing, Clegg responds, well, very little really. That's what makes this such a worthwhile record. I must be one of the very few who went through the 20th century and found it boring. Dismissing suggestions from Billy and Truly, he continues, no, I enjoyed being boring. It's very close to that state of spiritual tranquillity that the wise men seek. Clegg's home is first seen in the series one episode, Hail Smiling Morn or Thereabouts. He is outside checking his camping gear. When the trio enter the house, the interior shots are all in the studio. Next time we see the exterior of his home is in the series three episode, Going to Gordon's Wedding but only in the end credits. It's a different but very similar looking property. Clegg has not explicitly moved, this is just a different filming location. We also see this exterior in the Christmas 1978 special, again only in the end credits, and then in the opening of the series 5 episode, Full Steam Behind. However, we do get to glimpse this property again, not that you would realise it was the same building. It's seen from Daisy Lane in the opening scenes of the Series 6 episode, One of the Last Few Places Unexplored by Man, in the opening titles of the December 1986 special Merry Christmas, Father Christmas, and in the December 1988 special Crumbs. This property is now a very stylish holiday home. From Series 8, Clegg has a different home with Howard and his wife Pearl living next door but one. Howard frequently involves Clegg in his risky schemes to meet Marina without Pearl finding out. Clegg is reluctant to help Howard in his affair with Marina because he's terrified of her and Pearl. It's revealed in the series 18 episode A Sidecar Named Desire that he'd previously got trapped in a lift with Marina and she cuddled him for warmth, which traumatised Clegg. When not involved in any of Howard's schemes, Clegg is cautiously friendly with Pearl. In the series 12 episode, Das Welly Boot, Clegg moves here, Howard and Pearl move as well. They're next door. Several of the favours that Clegg gets persuaded to undertake for Howard are to deliver notes to Marina at her workplace, the supermarket checkout. The tables are turned in the series 14 episode, Happy Birthday Howard, when Marina lumbers Clegg with a huge toy panda to deliver to Howard. Howard also ropes Clegg in to deliver presents to Marina. Fortunately, he can rely on the rest of the trio for assistance. Buying a ceramic shepherdess figurine does not seem too difficult as a favour in the series 15 episode, Have You Got a Light Mate? But then he discovers it needs to be collected from Auntie Wainwright's shop. Clegg is terrified of going near Auntie Wainwright's shop because she always manages to sell him something that he does not want although frankly Auntie Wainwright will sell anything to anybody. Subsequent gifts to Marina he is entrusted with delivering include a bathtub in the series 15 episode Stop That Bath, 
and a five foot tall gnome in the series 22 episode Gnome and Away. As time passes, Clegg says no to Howard more insistently, on one occasion calling through the closed front door, pretending to be a recorded message, but he still got involved in his schemes. Throughout most of the show, Clegg is generally closer to Compo than the third man. Clegg is most devastated by Compo's death and feels guilty about not giving him a proper send-off. In the series 21 episode, Elegy for Fallen Wellies, a chance find by Truly enables him to give Compo the send-off Clegg wanted. As the item of lost property is not claimed, the police deliver the mystery box to Truly. At the end of the episode, Truly reveals to Clegg his special gesture. The lost property was painter's overalls and Truly has arranged for the townsfolk to stand on this hillside wearing the overalls, spelling out the words, See ya, Compo. In 2005, Salis's eyesight was deteriorating due to macular degeneration and he used a talking scanner to help him learn lines. From series 25 onwards, his role was gradually reduced due to his health, although there are occasional episodes where he still plays a major part. This is evident in the way that a lot of the scenes featuring Clegg show him alone in reaction shots, whereas the other characters are usually not shown individually. This will have meant that Peter Salis could film his lines and when the camera is shooting the rest of the characters, he need not even be on the set. In the series 28 episode, What Happened to the Horse, Clegg and Truly are sitting on the bank of this stream. Peter Sullis mistakenly refers to the fictitious tinker as Irish Jimmy, but earlier in the episode Alvin had named the tinker Irish Johnny. It seems it was probably considered that the mistake in the tinker's name was not significant, which would save Sullis making another take. In the last two series, Peter Sullis and Frank Thornton were now over 80, leading to complications over insurance when filming on location, so Roy Clark wrote short scenes for them, which could be filmed with a minimum of effort over a few days at Shepperton Studios. Despite appearing to be outdoors in some scenes, they performed in the studio in front of green screen and backgrounds were digitally added. Of course, this meant that Peter Solis's record of having been in every single episode wouldn't be broken. He appeared in all episodes of the prequel and was the only actor to appear in all 295 episodes of Last of the Summer Wine. He also said the last line of the final episode. Did I lock the door? Peter Solis died on the 2nd of June 2017 at a nursing home in Northwood, London. He is buried here in the churchyard of St John's Parish Church, Upper Thong, next to his friend and fellow Last of the Summer Wine actor, Bill Owen.